But this is, you know, the last two rows are empty today. Uh, oh, I'm doing a devotion. That's right. <laughs> five minute. Okay, see, our service starts with a five minute devotion. And I normally preach for 20 minutes. Oh, wait, I was a recruiter, so I, I kind of stretched things a little bit. So I normally preach for uh, 30 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, 50 minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Steve, you can, you can do whatever you want with this group. You stay up here as long as you want. Our record is 55 minutes, I think, 57. So... Uh, I'm going to read a verse out of 3 John. It's the last book in the Bible. Bef well, it's actually right before Revelation, I think. Well, then you have Jude, too. So you have the book of Jude, but then John, 3 John. Uh, let's pray for our whole entire service and those that are absent. Lord, <coughs> we just come before you this morning, Lord. And I ask that your spirit fall upon this place and guide us in your truth, Lord. Lord, that you would um, you would guard our hearts and our minds this morning. And Lord, that we would see your truth, Lord. And Lord, that this, sermon, this service would glorify you. And Lord, that you would be pleased in it. And Lord, I ask that you uh, anoint Stephen's lips as he uh, speaks this morning. And, Lord, let him speak what you, what you want him to speak, Lord. And, Lord, uh, let us hear the word this morning. And, Lord, as our worship goes up before you, as our music worship goes up before you this morning, Lord, please take joy and glory in it, Lord. Lord, for we are not worthy to, uh, to come before your throne, but, Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we are worthy. And, Lord, if it wasn't for your Son, Lord, we would... Uh, we wouldn't have any standing. We wouldn't be here. And, Lord, uh, we don't stand our, on our own, Lord. It's only through the blood of Jesus that we come before you. And, Lord, I ask right now that if we have any uh, sin in our hearts, Lord, that you would guard against that. And, Lord, that this morning's service, Lord, that you would keep our minds and our eyes and our hearts and focused on you and you alone, Lord. Lord, that we would not drift in our minds. Lord, that we would be able to give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, 3 John chapter 1, verse 4. Well, actually, there's only one chapter. Um, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. This is what John says, right? And, and, and what the deal was, was he heard that, that after all his preaching and the people, you know, that, that this person that this book was written to, was walking in the truth, and he heard about that later. And uh, that is good stuff to hear. I mean, uh, you know, here's John, Paul, Peter, all of them, after Jesus, were, were very concerned, even during the time of Jesus, because this whole, this whole world is, is either the lies of the devil or the truth of God. And that's what everything's based on, the lies of the devil or the truth of God. I mean, could you imagine like this church? This church is four years old. And uh, this, this last week. And what if we weren't preaching the truth? Then there would be no point in anything we do. Think about it. If we're not preaching the truth, if we're not dedicated to the truth that's in this word, then what's the point? So it is so important to stand up for the truth and, and to be in the truth. It, it's more important than anything. Look at Martin Luther as he was called before uh, the Catholic Church. You know, they, it was the entire establishment against Luther. And he went before because he had to stand for the truth. And he did. In this particular book, the word truth is used six times in 14 verses. There are only 14 verses in this book, and the word truth is used six times. See, when Solomon 
asked, when God came to Solomon in a dream, and he says, what would you ask for? What kind of wisdom did he ask for? He asked for, he says, therefore, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. How important is that? You see, you know, today the waters are muddy. They're very muddy today. Friday morning, we, we've been studying this book at 6 in the, is it 5? Five? 5 in the morning on Friday mornings, which means I have to get up at 4 at least to get there. And we're studying this uh, systematic theology of friendship being. And we decided now to go into the creeds and the confessions and the catechisms in the back of this book to go through those. But why do churches today, a lot of them, distance themselves from creeds, confessions, and catechisms? Why? When you look at the first, cre the, first the apostles' uh, creed, the very first one, and then you look at the second one, you see that these things are tailored because there's things that come against the church during that time period. And a bunch of men, men got together and women, uh, their wives, of course, got together. These men got together and, and, and developed these creeds and these catechisms and, and these, uh, these statements of faith. Why did they do that? Today, when you look at the, at the, at the churches in America, they all say we follow the Bible. But what do, what do they believe the Bible says about a particular thing or such? You see, if they didn't do that, today in the church, Jesus would just be a prophet. Jesus didn't really have a body. There was a heresy that said Jesus, he didn't really exist. It was just a mirage sort of thing, right? That, that was a heresy. And it says... There was another heresy that he didn't really suffer because since he didn't really have a body and he didn't really come, then he didn't really suffer, and then he didn't really die. Well, the problem is, is if he didn't really die, then you're not really going to heaven. And see, these creeds and confessions came out and said, no, we believe that Jesus Christ and all these attributes afterwards. And that's the reason why they wrote them give you an example of a more recent deal. The Baptist Confession of Faith, I believe it's, uh, what's it called? The uh, Faith and Message or something? It's a Confession of Faith for the Baptist Church, right? Well, in 1998, they added a whole paragraph called the family. Why would they add a paragraph called the family? And they give scripture quotes down there. Well, it starts off with this sentence. Marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in a covenant commitment for a lifetime. Gee, before 1998 or before the 90s, before the 80s, there was no need to define marriage as one man and one woman for a lifetime. But in 1998, they had to add this paragraph because the church had to take a stand. This is what we believe the Bible says about marriage. And that's why they have creeds and confessions is to rebut heresy that comes against the church and says, so if you say, I believe the Bible, what do you believe the Bible says on certain subjects? And that's where this comes from. Well, lastly, I'll tell you this. Why does Paul say we put on the armor of God? Why? Because here in Ephesians 6, 11, it says, Here's the reason why we put on the armor of God. Ephesians 6 and 11 says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You just don't put on the armor of God to put on armor and walk around with armor on. You put on armor for a reason. You've got to realize, especially in 2015, that the devil is attacking the church. And his attack is always against the truth. If he can get you to believe that something else is the truth, then he's won. Because you're no longer worshiping the true God. So put on the full armor of God, but the reason why we put it on is to guard against the attacks and the wiles of the devil. So... Um,